resident lighting specialist to our residential to Welcome to Residential Tech Talks. I'm Jeremy Glowacki, Executive Editor of Residential Tech Today. On this week's podcast, Arno Labori joins us from Paris, France, where he is CEO of Trinoff Audio. Over the past 20 years, Trinoff has earned a reputation for developing advanced sound processing technologies, including proprietary loudspeaker and room optimization, four element 3D mapping technology, and most recently, waveforming technology which promises to improve low-frequency reproduction in home theaters by actively shaping room acoustics rather than just treating them. This approach optimizes subwoofer interactions within any space, delivering consistent detailed bass across all seating areas. To learn more about these innovations and other new developments from the company, welcome Arno Labore to our podcast. Thanks for joining us today, Arno. Yes, hello. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy, for inviting me. Thank you for the opportunity and hello, everyone. So I'm really happy uh, to join and, uh, and talk a little more about uh, waveforming, I guess, what's coming, but maybe more generally speaking, uh, audio innovations, Yeah, if we have... Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a great, great approach. And I, before we get started, uh, you know, just the fact that you're in Paris, uh, in the Paris area and uh, we've got the Olympics coming up this week that so we're recording this on uh, Tuesday uh, Wednesday sorry tw the July 24th and on Friday is the opening ceremony so I'm looking forward to that I lived in Atlanta in 1996 when the uh, the Olympics were there I remember what a hassle it was leading up to the Olympics and how exciting it was when it actually started so what's it like there for you right now yeah it's both it's it's very exciting and uh, we will see how it goes uh, because we have to combine Olympic Games, Olympic Games with the, the let's say the French organization, which oh, okay. <laughs> let's say is a kind of legendary. Uh -huh. uh, and also we are halfway of a government change. Oh, right. Yeah. So we'll see the political situation is not that great at mm. the moment. Um, but I think the Olympic Games will uh, give us uh, a very positive uh, things. So it will be the opportunity to think about positive things and about sport and uh, more getting together. Yeah. So, no, I think that's, that's very positive. Um, the, the whole city is not exactly designed. <laughs> I wouldn't imagine. To yeah. To receive the, so there will be competition in the La Seine, the main river, or there will be some uh, interesting things. So let's let's see how it goes. And uh, I, would, I wouldn't uh, imagine that someone who is uh, is is in in the lab and developing audio technologies that like you are is necessarily a sports fan or a fan of sport, as you may say in Europe. Uh, what is your uh, focus? Are you going to try to attend any events or do you uh, you just want to be kind of around it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, more yeah, more around it. Yeah. But I mean, Trinov attends the Olympic Games indirectly because uh, we have some of our products that are used in the production of the Olympic Games. Okay. Uh, and uh, so we are doing some acoustic optimization, but also some immersive sound uh, decoding. Okay. Because there will be uh, objects uh, used to produce the Olympic Games. The, the technical infrastructure is quite impressive because they implemented a dedicated fiber optics network so that all the production is basically made uh, in big servers. So basically it's all produced in the cloud. Okay. So you no longer have, you know, the, the outside, the outdoor broadcast van, the OB van mm -hmm. that would produce the, the, the event on site. So now it's all made uh, in the cloud. So that's quite a technology shift and, and quite an achievement. And we are very proud to be part of that. Um, and about the, I will try to to see the some of the games, but uh, not maybe not the most popular. Yeah, that's how uh, I would probably be as well. Yeah. I, I prefer not to go to the crowded areas and uh, maybe find something that's a little less off the beaten path, as they say. But uh, 
um, yeah, it should be interesting. And uh, the I, we we got excited here because um, we have a, a two a three local uh, swimmers who who um, made the U.S. team, and uh, actually two are brother and sister, um, just out of high school. One of them's still in in high school. Um, the same school that my daughter attends. And so uh, we're excited about that. We had the qualifications here in Indianapolis where I am. So it, it was kind of a lead in to the Olympics, getting a little excited about comp- competition. I would have never attended a swimming competition had it not been, uh, you know, hosted here. But um, it was it was interesting to, to participate and see that as a, as a spectator. So you never know what you get excited about once you you actually attend something, even if it's not a sport that you're familiar with that much. Um, yeah. Well, let me get into it. I, I appreciate uh, the, the lead into the technology that you're uh, participating with uh, in the Olympics because I didn't even ex- expect that. But uh, can you give us a little bit of a history of, of what Trinoff has been a part of? I know that uh, a lot of it is recording studio type production, um, audio production as well. Uh, it sounds like broadcast production. Um, obviously here is what you're mentioning. So can you just give us a little bit of that history of the last 20 years that uh, the company has been involved in to get to where we are today? Yes. Uh, okay. So, well, I, I will try to make it yeah, yeah, in, in <laughs> short, <laughs> short enough, but yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, it all, in fact, it, it's quite related with, with waveforming because mm. we, we kind of closed the loop, but we, we started trying of focusing on uh, acous- acoustic field processing uh, the company has been established in 2003, but really the research work started in 2001. And maybe you remember that at that, at that time, it was 5.1 mm-hmm. uh, um, um, surround sound. Sure. But it was also the beginning of uh, high resolution audio, 192K, uh, DSD. And at Trinov, we felt that uh, really in terms of high resolution audio, we reached the, the maximum and there was only very marginal improvement uh, possible. So the future was really about the spatial aspect of sound, like the immersive aspect of sound. And this is why we really focused on how it is possible to control the, the spatial aspect of sound how we can really go to the fundamental aspect of sound, which is acoustic waves. Mm -hmm. And this is where this original work of Trinov is now very fundamental to waveforming because we go back to the waves. And really, if we want to to deal with what is sound, we have to go back to the original nature of sound. So sound is not really a microphone signal. It's not really a, a loudspeaker signal. Fundamentally, sound is sound waves. So when you are in the street speaking to someone, it's all about sound waves and it's not about microphones, loudspeakers and so on. So we really went very deep into the science and the research of acoustic fields. And we developed different technologies that at the time were applied to uh, multi-channel audio even though it was originally designed for 3D immersive sound okay. to really control the 3D aspect of sound. And we, the first product we released was a surround microphone. Uh, then the second one was an acoustic optimization processor. So the idea was to measure the characteristic of a room and then being able to improve the behavior of a loudspeaker in the room. So the whole idea was to try to make loudspeakers better in rooms. And uh, this technology has been uh, uh, very successful. We published papers at the audio engineering societies. And because the pro audio is very well connected to the audio engineering society, Mm -hmm. we had the opportunity to go in studios, make tests, especially broadcast studios. So the national broadcast companies in Europe are very well involved uh, at the AES. Mm-hmm. And the test has been really successful. So our technologies and first products have been adopted. 
and we started the business in, in, in pro. And we started to see some advanced uh, audio enthusiasts starting to use our pro products in their home mm. system. And personally, I, I'm, I've always been an audio enthusiast. Uh, you know, when I, I was at university, I was designing loudspeakers to, for my friends. <laughs> so I did maybe 10 different models of loudspeakers. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it was a, a lot of fun. So as an audio enthusiast, I understood this market quite well. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then we decided to create a, a, a range of products for the audio enthusiast uh, market. Okay. And uh, so that th that and, first mar the, the the first part of the three D microphone like that that's pretty um, I guess uh, unique in terms of the design of it and and so that was originally to to basically um, to test the room to to sample what was happening in the room. So you're getting um, the, the sound in three dimensions, right? With the way that it was this design there, call it, as the yes. name implies. Um, yeah. And, and then, so what were your first um, products there then for the consumer uh, market? Or yeah, it was the, the first products were uh, two channel uh, hi-fi products. Okay. So it was the ST2 hi-fi that was, well, basically it was processors to uh, improve the, the acoustics. So it was uh, uh, room correction processors. Okay. And, and we don't really like the term correction because we prefer optimization. Okay. Because when you only have two channels and you need to deal with the complexity of a 3D acoustics, you cannot really correct it's more about compensating the imperfections okay. and using a lot of uh, psychoacoustics to improve in, let's say, in the, in the perceptive domain. And this is where waveforming is game changer because it really does uh, change the physics of the room acoustics. So that's really what we could call active acoustics. Right. But uh, going back to that time and, and we are in... 2011. Okay. Yeah. So we release uh, two products. One is a processor. The other one is a preamp for stereo reproduction with possible with the possibility to have active crossover. And then in 20, uh, the, the next year, we release a 32 channel uh, optimization processor for home cinema. Wow. At that time, 32 channels was perceived as being completely excessive. But we already understood that uh, if you think about 7.1, as an example, mm -hmm. you already have uh, eight channels. But if you want to do bi amplification or three amplification for the, th the screen speakers, then you need to add six more. And if you want to uh, individually control each of the surround uh, speakers uh, in in high performance installations you don't have only a left surround and a right surround you have an, an array mm -hmm. of loudspeakers surrounding okay. you and if you want to drive individually each uh, loudspeaker then and if you want to add more subwoofers then you end up with high numbers of of channels okay so we already anticipated that the future would be uh, higher channel count, but it's interesting that you 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 jump from thir from two to thirty two the following year. So you you really felt like you perfected the technology in uh, yes, in, yes, the, in the stereo I, environment first. Uh, yes, because I it, yeah I, I did a, a big fast forward, but uh, <laughs> in the middle we uh, designed uh, processors for cinema, okay. commercial cinema. And uh, so we had to uh, offer up to 16 channels mm. of, uh, of room optimization. And, uh, and in fact, we knew that the future was, would be more channels. So this is why from the beginning, we designed a platform that was ready for 32 channels. Okay. And in fact, internally, it's a 64 channels uh, platform. We don't use all of them or they are not all available 
outside. Mm. We don't have all the connectors, but uh, fundamentally that's a 64 channels uh, platform. Okay. And um, and when immersive sound uh, happened, mm -hmm. uh, because of all our experience with immersive sound, we developed a lot of ideas and research about where to place the loudspeakers in a room. Mm. Um, so when immersive sound happened, you we simultaneously you had three format providers providing three different formats and not compatible. So you had the Dolby Atmos, uh, DTS X, mm -hmm. and Oro 3D. Right. And of course, each of these formats could support for Oro 3D. It was up to 13 channels. But the two others, DTS X Pro and Dolby Atmos, was about up to 34 and 33, uh, respectively. Um, and of course, you cannot expect someone to choose one format and place the loudspeakers according to only one format right. and stick to the content, only the content in that format. Right. So for the success of immersive sound, we had to resolve a key question, which is how it's possible to define one single loudspeaker layout that would be able to support all the three formats and potentially all the future formats. Hmm. And then, uh, of course, we want this unified speaker layout to work for multiple rows and a wide listening area. Mm -hmm. And we wanted this layout to work in the real world, in the practical world, where you, know, you have possibly multiple rows, maybe you have tiered settings. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you have one point which is the reference listening point. And then you have a circle around you and you place speakers around a circle. The, the speaker layout has to work in a real environment. And this is what we've been working on. And we published uh, guidelines, uh, speaker layout recommendation to achieve the compatibility. And because of that work, we, we've been invited by uh, Cydia to work on the RP22. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you're probably familiar with, with this document. That's the design guidelines for uh, high performance uh, immersive environments. Right. Yeah. And, that, and that's where um, I crossed paths with you last was at Cydia when uh, that was introduced to the press. Uh, the RP two twenty two um, as part of your your demo there um, for waveforming at CD Expo in uh, in Denver. So um, yeah, that 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 conversation happened there in person. But uh, I, it sounds like you you helped them helped lay the groundwork a lot for what they came up with in that document with your yeah and uh, yeah it was a great uh, honor to contribute to that document. And it, it's a collective uh, document. So the, mm -hmm. the principle is industry consensus uh, recommendation and standard. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's not a train of document, but yeah. uh, we've been, I mean, it, it's, we are very proud that we've been able to influence uh, this document to that point. And uh, it's uh, also a big uh, recognition from the industry. So we are very, very proud of this achievement. And it's a team achievement. It, it's uh, uh, not only uh, myself. At Trinov, we are uh, a bit more than 60 mm -hmm. person. So that's that's not uh, just one one person. For sure. That's, uh, um, well, it, it, the thing that, you know, if I could pick up just an overall point from RP22 is obviously, there, there like what you said, there is no exact design layout that you can do every there are so many parameters that go into it that you you have to accommodate those different changes and those uh the seating positions the tiered seating the room width and depth obviously all of that goes into it but then there's the 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 tuning i guess for, i have a different terminology there but uh the the optimization of the room then digitally to 
make it all work together as well. So there's there's a yeah. lot that goes into it. It's not just like here's how how you design it every time. No, that's not going to work. Yes, and Cydia has structured the different recommendation to it, and it's working exactly as you describe. So RP22 is the, the design guidelines. Mm -hmm. So it's giving all the best practice to how to design the project to make sure that the fundamental uh, um, concepts are in place mm. so that the performance can be delivered. So it's more like a, a design stage. And there is another document that is currently being uh, discussed. It's the, the measurement document. Mm. So that's how to confirm that the, the expected performance are actually delivered, delivered. And there is another document which is more about performance fact. So it's more about the performance of the different equipments mm. that uh, you're going to use. And the three documents are designed to work together. Okay. So you have how to uh, choose the equipments. So that's performance facts. How to use them in a design. So that's RP22, design guidelines. Mm -hmm. And then how to verify that the expected performance is delivered. So that's the measurement uh, document. And they, all the three work together. And, uh, and the, the beauty is that it's, it's living document because the technology is a continuous uh, evolution. Mm. And already uh, it took uh, five to six quite intense years to come up with RP22. And the first ID uh, was back uh, probably eight years ago. So it's been a very long... Uh, and now with technologies like waveforming, we are already reaching the next level where uh, waveforming can help to reach and even exceed uh, level four of, uh, of uh, the RP22. So one uh, very important contribution of, uh, of uh, RP22 uh, is the, the performance levels. Right. And, 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 and this is really an idea that has been uh, generated by the group. Uh, the, the, the chairman of this, of this group is Peter Eilet, mm -hmm. and he's, he's a very active uh, CDA member and he's been pushing this idea of performance levels. And level one is, let's say, the minimum requirement mm -hmm. for uh, a high-performance presentation of immersive sound. And level four is the aspirational level. So that's really the, the barely possible, really mm -hmm. on the edge of what's possible. And if we look at the low frequency parameters for, because you qualify for a level based on performance, based on parameters. Okay. And now with waveforming, uh, we have a solution to quasi guarantee that the project will be level four okay. in all of the four parameters uh, of the, the, the RP22. So, now something that was aspirational two years ago because of the progress uh, with technology is now uh, much more feasible and probably uh, maybe in, in two, three years, the document will need uh, an update mm. um, and maybe a level five or, or maybe adjust the, the criteria or the tolerance to make it... Uh, aspirational again. I thought it was interesting at Cedia because I, I the the I guess uh, preview of why I was attending that demo was RP22's unveiling, but uh, it wasn't technically uh, an RP22, um, I guess, approved project because that hadn't you know isn't built for a trade show. It it wasn't it didn't go through the actual criteria of the process. Um, but it seemed like an obvious level four to me 
just at a glance or at, at a listen. Um, but that was an example of, I guess, the ultimate in waveforming um, application in that demo that you had there. Uh, we just as a re reference point, and then we get into waveforming when you feel like that's it's the right time in the timeline here. But uh, how many uh, subwoofers were in that particular demo space? Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, yeah, 24 subwoofers. Okay, right. So the idea here uh, was really to create something uh, aspirational. Yeah, aspirational. It was mm -hmm. technology showcase. It was not really like showing a product that uh, anyone could buy tomorrow because we knew anyway that we would uh, release the technology in a very progressive way mm -hmm. through uh, uh, certified uh, dealers and selected projects, and uh, we've been doing that for a year. And now we are we are very confident about what we are releasing to the to the public. Um, but we really wanted to show what's possible, so it was like more like a vision of the future. Okay, and it's 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 more like with the progress with technology, this is possibly something that could be available to most high performance installations in maybe five to 10 years. Okay. Uh, and we really wanted to show what's possible because I believe that we are really at, a, at it's a breakthrough and there will be a before and after uh, waveforming or mm -hmm. active acoustics in, in general. Uh, because for the first time of the audio uh, in, uh, history, we have the possibility to control uh, the entire sound field in a room. Mm. And it, it was not possible uh, before. And we are really in a transition where before you had to optimize or to get a result at specific points in the room, so typically where you, play, you place the microphones, mm -hmm. using a limited number of loudspeakers or subwoofers. But really now with active acoustics and especially with waveforming, you have the possibility to control 100% uh, of what's happening in the listening area, and in some cases, in the entire room, like what we did at ISC at uh, Cydia last year, mm -hmm. we had a uniform uh, sound field across the entire room, uh, which uh, is only achievable uh, today. Like having a, a extremely uniform seat-to-seat uh, -seat, uh, uh, consistency within the enti entire listening area, but not only uh, beyond. Um, and also having a, a very effective time domain control. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, because the, the main problem in, in rooms is the, the resonances, the, uh, what we, we call the modes mm -hmm. uh, or the standing waves. And, and this is really a, a problem because the room is, is adding these resonances that sustain the the sound a very long time in the room. And in fact, if you want to have very high quality uh, bass, low frequencies, you need a lot of impact. And impact is related to time domain. So the sound needs to be fast. Mm. The sound needs to happen in the room and leave the room as quickly as possible. Right. Uh, just like the experience you you have when you go to a, a live concert, an outdoor concert, mm -hmm. and you have the kick of the of the drum, and you really feel the a kind of wave shock yeah. that comes to you. It's very tight, very controlled, and you only get this feeling uh, uh, outside. Uh, that's the same for like uh, fireworks. Yeah. So if you enjoy your fireworks, you really feel that shock wave that comes to you, and that really m m moves you in in a very uh, intense and controlled way. And unfortunately, 
uh, when you are inside a room, you can't really get this perception because the sound that is produced will resonate in the room. And uh, so the sound will stay a long time in the room. So there will be what we call a very long decay time. Right. And as the sound slowly decay, the new sound is coming in the room. Sure. So the old sound is mixed with the new sound and it creates a very confused uh, reproduction. So it's not fast, it's not articulated, there is no impact. And, uh, and really, uh, with new technologies like waveforming, and especially waveforming, we really control uh, the entire sound field in the three dimension of space, in the time domain, for all the frequencies. So we really have the full control of all the dimensions of the sound field. And this is something really new because before we didn't have that level of control. Today, we control the entire sound field. And once we control the entire sound field, that's it. I mean, we the sound, the sound field has three dimensions in space, the dimension in time. And uh, that's it. So this is why this ability to have this control is something really new. It, it's really a breakthrough. And uh, well, I, this is- I, I would love to touch on, I think, you know, for anyone that's listening, that's not, you know, done any research on waveforming yet, um, they're probably a little confused as to what it's actually doing. And I, I know that we could go into great technical detail. Like I listened, I told you, I, I, I listened to last year's, uh, um, I guess, webinar with Audioholics, Matt and Jean, they did a great job with you and you did the, the full presentation hour and a half. It was very enlightening, educational for me. And I understand how everything works uh, very well at this point, but I guess we need to do a version of that that's not that detailed, but uh, still get the point across. And I guess one of the main things I was going to want maybe to explain is how uh, you're, and I'm going to use the wrong terminology probably, but you're basically canceling those low frequencies by sending uh, a delayed signal back from the back wall with uh, other subwoofers. So it, that's that's kind of like it, in a dumb, very dumbed down, oversimplified version. Um, but there's that cancellation there, um, essentially. Is that how you could say it in a very, very oversimplified way? Uh, yes, that that's correct. So waveforming is based on two aspects, and you you yeah you cl- clearly described one of the two aspects, okay. which is uh, active absorption. Okay. So that's the idea of using <clears throat> loudspeakers not only to uh, produce sound, but also to absorb sound, and um, of course when the and, and it's based on uh, research about uh, acoustics and wave propagation and it's about understanding how standing waves or resonances happen and uh, in, a, in a very simple way uh, what we don't want to do is to have two waves that that collide together so as an example you have one wave that comes from like a front a loudspeaker that is at the front of the room traveling through the, the room from front to back. Mm-hmm. And then you have a reflection or another loudspeaker that is producing a wave from the back to the front because the two waves will collide. It will, it will clash. And this wave collision is the, the mechanism of creating uh, standing waves okay. and resonances. So at all costs, what we what we need to do is to avoid wave collisions, and this is why the uh, waveforming technology uh, is including active absorption. So when the wave is generating from the front of the room, traveling through the room, then the wave is absorbed actively by loudspeakers or subwoofers at the other end of the room. So it's not so they're not colliding in the room. But what, where are they connecting to basically create that active absorption? Right at the back wall? Um... Uh, yes, right at the back wall. Okay. So basically, uh, 
in fact, when you have lo- when you have loudspeakers, and just to clarify, this idea about active absorption is probably like 20% of the waveforming technology. Okay. So then after I will explain the other part, mm-hmm. which is uh, probably uh, 80% okay. of the, the the success of the technology. But I, I want to finish with the, sure. the uh, active absorption because that's something key. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a new concept because up to this idea of active absorption, we would use loudspeakers mainly to produce sound and not to absorb Mm -hmm. sound. Sure. So, and to put it in simple words, uh, technically, it's not really possible to absorb sound. So what we do is that we overlap the opposite of the sound we don't want. Okay. Okay, so we basically, we cancel. Mm. So it's more about reflection cancellation than about uh, re- really uh, absorption. And uh, so when you have a loudspeaker at the front of the room or a loudspeaker array, but let, let's just say it's a loudspeaker at the moment. So the loudspeaker at the front will produce a wave. The wave will travel the, through the room and then we will bounce of the back wall Mm -hmm. and this is precisely what we don't want the 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 beginning of the problem happens when the sound is bouncing off the back wall right because until the the wave front has reached the opposite wall there is no problem i mean the 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 wave travels like if it was in free air Mm -hmm. just like if there was no walls and until the wave has reached the walls, the wave doesn't even know that there are walls. <laughs> so everything is perfect. The loudspeaker produces the sound, the sound propagates through the audience. Everything is perfect until the sound wave reaches the opposite wall and bounces back. And this is the beginning of the problem because we have this reverse wave coming back <laughs> Right. in opposite direction and it's producing uh, uh, standing waves. So what we are doing is that we are using additional loudspeakers or subwoofers to basically uh, overimpose the opposite of the reflection. Mm-hmm. So, and the, the net result, if everything is perfect, the net result is uh, zero. There is nothing that comes back from the wall. Okay, And it's equivalent to having the loudspeaker that absorb the, the back wall reflection. Okay. And, uh, and waveforming is, is using the, the, the available loudspeakers or subwoofers for both emission and absorption. Okay. But really another concept which is really key with, with waveforming is uh, the, the, the control of the directionality of sound. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to, just to describe that, I'm going to speak about uh, normal speakers, like uh, uh, standard loudspeakers for mid and high frequencies. Sure. And as you know, all the, these loudspeakers, they have some directivity control. Mm-hmm. They have some form of directivity control, whether it's, it's a waveguide for uh, like a small, uh, home theater uh, loudspeakers or it, for large rooms, large home theater or commercial cinema, it can be a horn, mm-hmm. which is a very large uh, waveguide. Uh, it can be for, for live, for concert, it can be a line array mm-hmm. where multiple uh, drivers are used together to steer the sound to produce some directionality. And all this effort is to control uh, what to control the dispersion of the loudspeaker in the room. Because and, and it's maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but an omnidirectional loudspeaker would not be the best loudspeaker. If the loudspeaker is able to produce sound in, in all directions, it's an omnidirectional, then it means that the loudspeaker will produce the sound to the audience, which is what we want. 
but the loudspeaker will produce a lot of sound to the walls mm -hmm. and it will stimulate the acoustic of the room in a very excessive way. Right. And of course, it's always possible to absorb the room a lot, like putting a lot of acoustic absorption. But in the end, over treated rooms can sound a little dead. Right. So it's not, I mean, it could work, but that's probably not the most effective way. So instead of having a loudspeaker that is uh, stimulating the room in all directions, not only the audience, but everywhere, and having and implementing a massive acoustic treatment to, it's, uh, it's a much more efficient idea to just have a loudspeaker with a controlled directivity sure. that will only or mainly uh, steer the sound to the audience and limit the amount of energy that is sent to the walls so that the room acoustics uh, remains under control. And, uh, and this is always implemented in the, the mid and high frequencies. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem we have with uh, low frequencies is that it's omnidirectional. Mm. So a subwoofer is omnidirectional uh, because of its size. And even an 18-inch, 21-inch uh, or 24-inch subwoofer is still omnidirectional because the wavelength is so long that the, 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 the subwoofer is very small compared to the wavelength to reproduce. So it's always like a point and the, the subwoofer is omnidirectional. So the problem that we've been able to uh, avoid for the mid-high frequencies, we still have this problem uh, at the low frequencies. Right. And instead of like uh, uh, blasting the entire room with bass and having to implement a lot of absorption, whether it's a passive absorption or active absorption, um, it's, it's a much more efficient idea to try to introduce directionality in the low frequencies. And to introduce directionality, uh, you, you would need a very big subwoofer, which is... Uh, not really available. Okay. So then we go back to the idea of the line array. Mm -hmm. So remember the, the, the concert hall uh, uh, PA uh, loudspeakers, which are line arrays. So multiple loudspeakers with the appropriate DSP can allow to focus the sound in specific directions mm. to, to, to create directionality. So by uh, using at least two subwoofers and, and with two subwoofers, it's already very effective and, and, and we can discuss this after. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is to use a, a subwoofer array. So multiple subwoofers working together, producing the sound together to create the, uh, the optimum uh, uh, wavefront mm -hmm. that will uh, steer the sound to the audience. Uh, not to the walls, so that we avoid creating problems. So, and, and with this approach, we don't even have to absorb because we didn't create the problem in the first place. And this is where uh, waveforming is, uh, is unique because the algorithm understands the concept of, uh, of uh, subwoofer arrays so the waveforming algorithm is able to uh, work with uh, an array of subwoofer producing a very clean and optimum uh, wavefront by driving individually each uh, subwoofers. And, and this is really unique and it's a patented uh, feature of, uh, of uh, waveforming. But it's not only that, it's even more because remember the, the big horn, the mm -hmm. big waveguide, the cinema horn. In fact, we are using the room as a horn. So we, we are using the room as a waveguide. And, and, and this is where waveforming is a, is a very comprehensive approach. Because 
it's not only trying to make like a loudspeaker a better loudspeaker. So waveforming is not trying to make each loudspeaker individually better loudspeakers. Waveforming is uh, using all the available uh, subwoofers together to create a wavefront. Right. And waveforming, and this is why we, we choose this name, because waveforming is, is not working really on, on loudspeaker level, like making each loudspeaker a better loudspeaker. It's using uh, all the loudspeakers together to create the, the best and strongest uh, wavefront. Right. And uh, yeah, and, and coming back to the idea of using the, the room itself as a waveguide, mm -hmm. uh, now that we have a loudspeaker array, so the loudspeaker array is matched to, to match the room as a waveguide. So basically, we create a wavefront at, at the front of the room, for instance, in such a way that the room can guide the wave. Okay. as the wave travels uh, through the room. And it's a very efficient uh, method because it's organizing all the reflections and all the contribution of the room is no longer a problem that we are trying to fight against and we are trying to avoid. The room becomes a benefit. So the, the room is going to increase the efficiency of the low frequency reproduction. So first we have the array. So an array is, is, is a very efficient way to reproduce uh, sound or in our case, low frequency. Mm -hmm. So if you array two subwoofers, the result is plus six dB. So that's four times the power. Okay. So if you use two subwoofers, you feed them by twice the power because you have two of them, but the output is four times the power. You gain efficiency. Okay. So array is a very efficient uh, way uh, to reproduce bass. And the, if we use the room as a waveguide, we also gain efficiency. Uh, just like uh, a, a horn loaded uh, loudspeaker. So the horn, Will, will not only control the directivity, but will increase the efficiency uh, of the loudspeaker. And uh, yeah, and, and in a horn, the horn is designed in such a way that all the reflections in, in the horn contribute to the, the wavefront that is created in the horn. And you can think of the same idea in the room. All the reflections from the side walls from the floor and ceiling are no longer, let's say, destructive or problematic reflections. They are beneficial reflections that helps uh, to increase the efficiency of the first wavefront. Okay. And, uh, and with this idea of controlling the directivity, um, basically we resolve 80% uh, of the problems. Okay. Uh, uh, and really the, the last problem that remains is the back wall uh, reflection. Okay. Um, because we, we create that nice wavefront, a very powerful wavefront, where all the acoustic is positively uh, combined mm -hmm. in, a, in a very constructive way. So we create that very powerful wavefront. It travels to the audience. But unfortunately, sound waves, they cannot stop halfway. Mm -hmm. So when you launch a wave, it has to continue until it reaches the opposite wall. And this is where we need to use active absorption to uh, absorb this, this, this wave and avoid the reflection. Right. And that's, so that gets uh, back to where I, I started you kind of exactly. at the end. But, um, yeah. so, the, so when you're, when you're controlling that wave front going through, you're still using some passive um, absorption in the room as well to help that process. Is that true? Um, or is it all like, yes. Okay. Uh, it's, well, active, 
active acoustics uh, and, and waveforming, but all kinds of active acoustics is very, very effective up to a specific frequency okay. that is called the aliasing frequency. Uh, that is defined by the distance between two adjacent uh, mm -hmm. loudspeakers. Okay. So if the loudspeakers are like maybe two meters, 2.5 meters away, so meters, do you, do you see what? Uh, mm -hmm. So probably that's maybe eight feet. Yeah. Eight feet. Yeah. So. If the, the, the subwoofers are close enough, they will create a, a very nice wave front mm -hmm. and a very uniform reproduction across the entire uh, sound field. But if subwoofers are too far apart, they will, uh, they will create what we call uh, wave interference. Okay. So they will create cancellation mm. and uh, so at some point in the room, it, uh, the sound pressure level will double. Mm. It will be plus 6 dB. But at other points in the room, it will cancel. It will be uh, zero. So, so this is why active acoustics uh, works until a predefined frequency okay. uh, that is related to the distance between uh, adjacent uh, speakers okay and, and there is no way to go uh, around that uh, unfortunately so active acoustics works really really well until probably like 100 hertz mm. then a little less until probably 150 and then above that frequency it's uh, only passive acoustics okay and this is where the the frequency range between 100 and, and 150 is the is a kind of crossover between passive acoustics and active acoustics and uh, and active acoustics is not really a, a, a replacement for passive acoustics okay. it's more uh, complementary sure and it's very very effective in the in the very low frequencies okay where passive acoustics would require very very deep bass mm -hmm. trap right something not really practical sure sure um well um the that i think that covers things very well for what we need to get into in terms of explaining it uh and maybe just for those who you know know about other calibration technologies that are out there uh we clearly have defined unique aspects to to wave you know uh waveforming and and what what Trinoff is doing here with with all of this but uh, how would you say you're you measure up compared to other competitive technologies that are out there if anyone's saying well I, I use this other particular one we won't name names but uh, what is what are the other advantages beyond what we just covered that uh, Trinoff offers technology wise in the yeah I think the the main difference is uh, the, the the how well waveforming uh, focuses on uh, on subwoofers right so uh, maybe there will be evolution of the technology in the future but but right now uh, the idea is that subwoofers are loudspeakers designed to reproduce low frequencies this is where they excel mm -hmm. and we don't really want the other speakers to try to contribute to the very low frequencies. Okay. They they are they are not designed for that and they are they are limited. So we we really focus on um, low frequencies using loudspeakers that are designed for low frequency reproduction and and excel in, in that frequency range. And uh, we do it in the way that is uh, the most uh, efficient way. So the, the idea of uh, not only controlling the, the sound field with absorption, but also at the emission, mm -hmm. how we, we steer the bass, the, combina the combination of steering the bass plus absorbing is, in our opinion, the, the, the most effective uh, uh, solution. And so you can get uh, a certain level 
of performance with fewer subwoofers or with the same amount of subwoofers with the correct uh, uh, subwoofer layout, mm -hmm. you can achieve uh, higher performance. And, and, and this is where uh, 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 waveforming uh, focuses. Um, yeah, I think that's so. So, one. What, with the rollout for the past year, you were talking about how it was it was a very targeted rollout to professionals in the uh, home theater space who you could work with directly on this. And uh, now you've gotten to a more uh, open availability. Can you describe how it's uh, becoming available to to others to expand this opportunity to to use waveforming in the uh, CDA space? Yeah, so now we have um, we have uh, more experience from the field uh, with waveforming. So we the official announcement for the the public release uh, will be August fifteen. Okay. Uh, so we are uh, working on that, and uh, so the wave waveforming will be uh, available to uh, any. Uh, altitude uh, owner, uh, uh, our existing uh, users or uh, new uh, altitude uh, owners, okay. and it will be um, um, released with a set of tools, okay. um, uh, like as an example, a subwoofer layout uh, design tool. So, because a fundamental question with waveforming is, and it, it's not specifically about waveforming, that's it's uh, physics, it's acoustics. Okay. Uh, some loudspeaker layout are working better than others. And uh, to have the best possible performance, we release a tool to help our users to place their uh, subwoofers in the best possible location. Mm -hmm. Um, we are going to release also tools to help with the calibration. And the calibration process is, is quite uh, simple. Uh, it's, uh, you just take uh, measurement points uh, that you collect in the listening uh, area. Mm -hmm. not, not a small listening area, a large listening area, because with waveforming, it's based on controlling the waves. So we really want to, to see the waves and because of the wavelength, so the, 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 the wavelength, meaning that the wave of a full, the, the length of a full wave can, can be uh, up to, uh, I mean, for 20 Hertz, as an example, it's 17 meters. Mm. So that's probably uh, in feet, maybe like uh, 50 feet. Okay probably something like that. So it's very long. Yeah. And if you really want to, to see the 3D waves in the room, so if you want to see the propagation, if you want to see the direction, if the wave is, uh, if there is a reflection from the right wall and the wave is coming from the right or coming from the left or the ceiling, the floor or whatever, because the the waves are coming from all directions, and we really want to see these directions to really have a, a directional control of the field. We, we need to see these waves, so we need to capture the listening area over a large uh, zone mm. to make sure that the directionality in the sound field is captured. And that's also something that is uh, quite different from other technologies which are basically measuring in a much smaller area that is very, very small compared to the wavelength that we have to deal with. And because of that, the, the measurement or the analysis of the, all the directions of the sound field is not as precise. Mm. As, as what can be done if we really measure over a, a very wide uh, uh, listening area. Okay. Uh, so we are going to release tools to help with microphone placement. Okay. Uh, also some uh, 
documentation tutorials and uh, but really uh, and maybe that's the opportunity to uh, discuss that because the trend of processors and technologies are very advanced mm -hmm. to the point that they can be a little intimidating okay. to some users and 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 really the the products and the technologies are are very simple to use um, because one benefit of uh, of uh, using very powerful uh, processors and it's it's a direct benefit of our platform because it's a cpu based platform so it's about 10 times more powerful than dsp based uh, platform mm. and because it's so powerful the product can integrate not only the filters but it can integrate all the the measurement process and also all the computation process so really everything is packaged into the processor okay and you don't need external tools okay so basically uh, all the measurements are made from the processor all the computation happens in the processor with it's uh, for waveforming it is just a few minutes like it's mm. uh, i think it's even less than three minutes okay it's very fast and everything is right there so you don't need uh, as an example to set up an external laptop uh, to load uh, an external th software on that laptop you don't need to pre-configure your processor connect it to your laptop synchronize then hook a, a sound card to your laptop, connect the microphone, run the measurements, do the computation, and reload the filters, uh, and making sure that uh, because potential, well, very certainly your laptop will have a consumer operating system. It will be a Windows based or something like that. So it's not guaranteed that the measurement will not be corrupted and so on. So it's um, it's a complex set of tools to put together where in the train of processor you just go to the calibration page and follow what we call the calibration wizard mm. so there is step one okay connect your microphone then step two uh, do the first point second point and so on and at the end compute and that's it and everything happens in the in the processor mm. and you have access to a lot of interesting uh, uh, and very unique um, uh, parameters like control the decay mm. so if you want to make your room a little more dry or a little more live mm -hmm. you have a decay control uh, um, um, parameter okay and also uh, once you have done a calibration Let's say that uh, one month after you would like to tune it a little more. It's very easy. You you load your preset, you adjust one or two parameters, recompute, save. That's it. Okay. Uh, you don't have to remember uh, where was the original calibration file on the the laptop that did the <laughs> calibration. Right. And then uh, change a parameter, recompute and reload the, the filters in your processor and hoping that by the time someone else didn't do other changes that will be overridden or right. the, this kind of thing. So what I'm trying to say is that our platform is powerful enough to include everything inside. Right. So there's no need to for extra external tools. Everything is fully integrated. And uh, and and it's uh, it's very fast and effective to do uh, a calibration. Are you? Um, I would imagine you're going to be doing demonstrations of this at Cedia then in September, so that you can really show, showcase how simple this is for e, uh, altitude uh, owners. That's probably something we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah, what, yeah. What, is, what, is your, what is your um, uh, presence going to be at CD? I just, um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, what, what are you thinking yeah, in terms yes. of? Yes, your... so CD, we, uh, yeah, we, we will not do 
a presentation that is as massive as okay. what we have done in the past, mm -hmm. but it will still be uh, uh, very impressive. Uh, we will do the the CDA announcement in, uh, I guess, in a few weeks. Okay. So maybe I, I, I don't want... Sure enough. Exactly now to, to give too much information, but it we will not try to do like a minimalist uh, waveforming. And maybe I can talk about what, because we did a lot of, uh, let's say, minimalist uh, waveforming with a, a, a small number of subwoofers. So maybe I can, I can discuss that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but our CDR presentation will be, uh, because last year we presented a very powerful, and controlled bass. Mm -hmm. And we've been exploring the subsonic uh, domain mm -hmm. down to a few Hertz, like it was, I think it was seven Hertz. Uh, so very powerful, very deep and very controlled uh, bass. Uh, this year, we will add also um, a, a level of refinement. So um, because we, in a way, we kind of established uh, and, and, and we are very happy of this success. We kind of established a trend of uh, uh, elevating the, the performance of low frequency reproduction. Mm -hmm. And we've seen in the, the recent months uh, other demonstrations using uh, a lot of subwoofers. And uh, so we really feel that we are kind of uh, pushing the industry okay. in this direction sure. of uh, and I and, and we can really feel the the difference because when we did the first waveforming demo it was at ISC 2023 right okay it was perceived as like we lost our mind <laughs> excessive right <laughs> yeah. excessive yeah excessive that that's the word completely excessive and then we did the uh, CDR 2023, and I think it will remain our most excessive demo ever. But that was, uh, but just to showcase what's possible. Mm -hmm. um, but I think now the the industry is uh, seeing the benefit mm. and experiencing this level of of low frequency control. So now I think the message has been uh, uh, clear enough, has been well received. And uh, and now we are working on uh, less uh, demanding uh, uh, installations. Okay. And uh, so uh, waveforming can can work with as few as uh, four subwoofers. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, two at the front of the room, uh, basically on the wall, at uh, specific positions, and two at the rear, and our experience with the, the, let's say, the minimalist waveforming installation that we have done is that it's not so complicated to put the two subwoofers on the wall. Uh, first, because this is behind the screen. Sure. So you have room behind the screen and the two subwoofers, they fit nicely between the LCR. Mm -hmm. So you fit one between L and C, the other one between C and R and it fits quite well and anyway you you have to elevate your lcr speakers sure. anyway you you would not uh, leave them on the floor so you have to lift them mm -hmm. so while you lift them you can also lift the subwoofers and a lot of loudspeaker manufacturers they are now proposing all kinds of brackets uh, so that you can do on wall uh, mounting you can put it on a kind of pedestal or it can even be in wall mounting. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of products that are now available to do this kind of installation. And it's, it's not really, it's not as complicated as it sounds. Okay. And really with two subwoofers on the front wall, two subwoofers on the rear wall, uh, it's enough to cover rooms that are as wide as uh, five meters, which should be like 17 feet okay. by two meters 60, which is like 8.5 uh, feet. And 
the length doesn't really matter. Mm. So the length is it can be as long as you want because the room acts as a waveguide. Right. So the, the length doesn't really matter. So with only four subwoofers, we can very effectively cover rooms that are over 50 square meters, which mm -hmm. is probably 550 square f uh, feet, which is a nice uh, size for a home theater. It's already a nice size. Um, and this is very effective. Now, in some situations where you, you cannot really lift your subwoofers behind the screen, you have to keep them on the floor. Mm -hmm. Then we developed uh, uh, other subwoofer arrays. So in that case, instead of creating a planar wave, we create a cylindrical wave. Mm. So instead of trying to do a planar array, like subwoofers in the middle of the wall, mm -hmm. on the wall, the subwoofers are on the floor. So the subwoofer array is a line array. It's a line array of two subs on the floor, uh, placed one quarter of the room width. And uh, this subwoofer layout is very similar to uh, what uh, Todd Welty from Arman mm -hmm. introduced, uh, I guess it's uh, even more than 10 years ago. I think it, his paper was from 2006 or eight, mm -hmm. 2008, I, I think. And, uh, and it was a very effective uh, subwoofer layout to control for modal control of the, of the, the sound field. So this is exactly the same uh, subwoofer layout, except that the processing that, that is used is very different sure. because we are trying to create a cylindrical wave and cancel it mm -hmm. at, the, at the back wall. And also uh, we support uh, four subwoofers at the four corners of the room. Um, so in that case, it will be a compromise Mm. because the, the subwoofers are quite far apart and they will not be as effective to create the nice wavefront that we want to, to build. So here there is a, um, some sort of compromise, but the results are, are, are still very interesting. In most cases, waveforming is, uh, is, uh, uh, is producing an improvement. And we even tried with random uh, subwoofer placement, which we do not recommend. Okay. Uh, because, well, that's possible. Waveforming will, uh, will deliver an improvement. Mm -hmm. But really the best performance is the combination of optimal subwoofer placement and the waveforming algorithm. Okay. And so, and, and the, the improvement you, you get is not uh, small. It's, uh, so if you have a situation with random subwoofer placement, you have four subwoofers, random positions, you run waveforming, you get a level of improvement. Then if you place them at the four corners, you get more improvement. Now, if you place them at the quarter of the, the width of the room, like the, the Todd Welty um, mm -hmm. uh, layout, then you start to, to get a really nice improvement because the subwoofer uh, array is able to create a nice wavefront that, that we are looking for. Um, and if you can lift your subwoofers uh, on the wall, then you get... Uh, well, you get the optimal performance. Right. And the beauty of it is that basically it's free performance. So all you need is to move your subwoofers and you improve the performance. So I, I guess every user will make uh, his choice. Uh, maybe the effort of moving the subwoofers versus the, the additional performance. Right. And... Uh, well, but, that, uh, that, that gives us a lot to, to work with. And I encourage everyone uh, who is going to Cedia to, 
to look for uh, Trinoff there. And I know that there's a, a process for signing up for demos that uh, uh, we'll probably get when the announcement comes out about your uh, you know availability in, in Cedia plan. So we'll follow up with that. But uh, for now, um, I think we we've probably talked enough, and we'll 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 catch up at Cedia for sure. So thank you so much for your time today and giving us so much detail. No, thank you, Jeremy. It was uh, really a pleasure, and thank you for all your questions. Well, enjoy enjoy the Olympics. Hope it uh, is is a success there for for, for Paris and yeah. for the the entire country. So I hope everything goes well there. And uh, want to thank you for uh, your time today. Um, Ar- Arno Labore is the CEO of Trinoff Audio, and you can learn more about his company at trinoff.com. That wraps up today's show, which was produced by Residential Tech Today, IPW and Pretty Easy Podcast. If you're new to Residential Tech Talks, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you watch or listen to this episode. Also check out all the latest residential tech news at our magazine's website, restechtoday.com, where you can also subscribe to the print or digital magazine to our Tuesday and Thursday email newsletters. Until next time, please stay safe, stay inspired, and let us know if you have a great story to tell. Residential Tech Talks, Lighting Specialist, Smart House.